While the interior chambers were built with red granite from a swan, most of the pyramid was made from local limestone, weighing between 2 to 15 tons per block. There is debate on how the pyramid stones were moved into place. Recent research is exploring the idea that it was built around a large interior ramp. The recently discovered logbook confirms that the high quality limestone of the outer casing was brought by boat across the Nile from a quarry in Tura. Once complete, the smooth white polished stone of the Great Pyramid would have reflected the sunlight like a beacon, earning it the name the Horizon of Khufu. Over the centuries, thieves and travelers attempted to access the Great Pyramid numerous times. Ancient writings describe details of its interior, proof that some made their way within, though who gained entrance first and when is unknown. The main entrance of the Great Pyramid is located 17 meters above ground level. It faces north, likely in order to align with the North Star. Though the entrance passageway had been discovered in antiquity, any further access into the Great Pyramid was stopped by massive vertical slabs of rock. As such, present-day visitors to the pyramid must use the robber's entrance. The robber's entrance is reported to have been opened in the 9th century by Caliph al-Mamun. In search of treasure, the Caliph had his men dig their way inside the Great Pyramid. The most likely scenario is that they enlarged a corridor which had been created by tomb robbers during antiquity. As such, this is how the team can justify access to this wonder. Attempts to gain entry to the Great Pyramid and uncover its potential secrets continued throughout the centuries. In the 19th century, the belief that another entry existed at the south side resulted in a hole being blasted into the pyramid side, with no results for the damage that was done. While the search is still ongoing today to uncover more hidden rooms and passageways, conservation is the primary concern of all such efforts. Welcome to the Great Pyramid of Giza, Upper Chambers. At the entrance of the ascending passage are three granite flagstones estimated to weigh up to 25 tons each. They were used to protect the Great Pyramid from thieves. Undaunted by the granite blocks, the thieves simply dug into the softer limestone around them, thus creating the robber's entrance. While in reality the robber's entrance is one single cavity which leads to both passages, in the game, the team created individual accesses to either passage. As such, in the game, one entrance leads to the ascending passage, while another leads to the descending passage. The ascending passageway of the Great Pyramid provides a direct path into the Grand Gallery and is accessed 30 meters from the entrance along the descending corridor. Both corridors have similar dimensions and are designed with the same 26 degree incline. The ascending corridor has smooth masonry on its walls and the layout includes many trapezoidal stones. Both the floor and ceiling of the passageway indicate that the passage was enlarged, possibly during or after the funeral, to allow workers room to move granite blocks meant to plug the corridor. The Grand Gallery's purpose is still debated among experts. It may have been intended to align with the stars, act as a buffer to protect the king's chamber, or simply to facilitate the transport of the granite blocks used inside the pyramid. Access to the queen's chamber was at the beginning of the Grand Gallery. Though this room is referred to as the Queen's Chamber, it is believed that there was no queen buried here. Based on their knowledge of earlier pyramids, 
Egyptologists believe it was more likely intended as the king's serdab, a chamber meant to contain the Ka statue, which would in turn house the king's spirit. Situated exactly within the pyramid's center, on the east-west axis of the pyramid, the chamber has a vaulted ceiling and measures 5.7 by 5.2 meters. In the eastern wall, there is a niche tucked away in a small corbelled archway, which may have originally held the Ka statue. Behind this niche is another smaller hole, possibly dug out by thieves in search of further treasure. In the 19th century, two shafts were found running through the north and south walls. They each run in a horizontal line for two meters before sloping upward, and both are closed off with limestone blocks fitted with copper handles. Whether they were intended as ventilation shafts for workers or a celestial connection for the pharaoh's spirit is unconfirmed. A recent scan of the room indicated the presence of an unknown cavity hidden behind the north face of the walls over the descending corridor. Further investigation is still ongoing to ascertain the nature of the anomaly so as to avoid risking damage to the monument. Khufu's architects were possibly influenced by earlier rhomboidal pyramids when designing the gallery. It is the longest corbelled vault ever built, measuring 47 meters long and 8.6 meters high. The walls were made to taper inward, allowing for better distribution of weight. As a result, the ceiling measures just over a meter wide at its highest point. Though this construction technique is present in other pyramids, Few have the same precision and stability. While the space is visually dramatic, the gallery seemed to serve a practical function, though what exactly remains uncertain. Still, the wall design was undoubtedly meant to contribute to the stability of the structure, and its floor may have helped workers move the materials. A channel runs along the middle of the room, a movable floor originally rested in this central recess. The raised benches on either side are equipped with slots that may have been used to help position the granite blocking stones. At the end of the grand gallery is the entrance to the antechamber leading to the king's chamber. Directly above, there is another narrower horizontal passage that connects to the top of the king's chamber and allow the workers access to the weight relief rooms. 
The far end of the grand gallery leads to a small antechamber with a portcullis, preventing access to the king's chamber. The portcullis was composed of three separate granite slabs. They were designed to be lowered into place and sealed the chamber after the burial of the king. The grooves dug out to hold the slabs in place are still clearly visible to this day. The elaborate locking system was composed of a series of grooves for the ropes and pulleys that dropped the stones into place like the notches on a key. For the purposes of the game, the team elected to remove the portcullis slabs in order to grant the player access to the king's chamber. In reality, workers would have backed out of the room after the funeral, lowering each slab into place behind them one at a time. Each of the three stones were smashed by looters centuries later, and evidence of their break-in is still evident. The king's chamber is built entirely out of red granite. The king's chamber measures 5.8 meters in height. It has an imposing cover of five stacked levels above, with granite beams weighing 25 to 40 tons each. The uppermost level is surmounted by a vault of stones, arranged in chevrons to bear the enormous structural load. As in the Queen's Chamber, two shafts extend out from the room towards the north and south faces of the pyramid. They measure nearly 64 meters until they are blocked by copper-handled granite plugs. Some experts in the culture of the Old Kingdom believe that the shafts were thought to lead the king's soul to the stars, with the incarnation of the pharaoh as the god Ra, represented by the northern well, and the god Horus by the southern well. There is a granite sarcophagus at the west end of the room, but it is the concealed construction inscriptions left by workmen on the roof's stones which verify this as the resting place of Khufu. The sarcophagus was recorded as being empty when it was discovered, and its design indicates that there was once a lid in place. It's possible that this sarcophagus is only a cenotaph in memory of the pharaoh, but was never actually meant to receive the body. Khufu's mummy was never found. It is hoped that as of yet undiscovered hidden rooms and shafts of the pyramid may provide an answer as to its location. Welcome to Jean-Pierre Houdin's Theories. The team wanted to provide players with a sense of exploration and discovery, particularly within the Great Pyramid. As such, a decision was made that the internal design of the monument in the game would reflect Jean-Pierre Houdin's theories. While the antechambers of the king's tomb have yet to be discovered, Houdin posits that this is merely due to a unique design, placing the pharaoh's tomb at the center of the pyramid. The entire tour you are about to take was designed along Houdin's hypotheses. While respecting Houdin's hypothesis as to the general layout of the antechambers, the team wanted the contents to enhance the game experience. In regular royal tombs, the antechambers were filled with all the material goods needed by the pharaoh in the afterlife. To support the feelings of discovery and awe, the art team created a unique and fantastical treasure in this second antechamber. Houdin theorized that the ascending corridor and the great gallery were used by the workers to haul hoist the heavy beams above the king's chamber. He called it the service circuit. The corridor you are in now was created by the team following Houdin's theory and is referred to as the Noble Circuit. It is through this corridor that the wooden sarcophagus containing the pharaoh's mummy would have been transported to its final resting chamber. With this structure in mind, 
one can easily assume that the pyramid's entrance would have been connected to the two antechambers. Modern research has revealed that a cavity might be located behind the north face chevrons of the pyramid. As such, the team chose to create this area for the player to explore. Here is where Houdet believes that the priests and nobles would have exited the pyramid after the burial ceremony. Many theories regarding the construction of the Great Pyramid rely on the usage of external ramps. However, Houdet believes an external ramp would have been too steep for the upper portion of the pyramid. This is why he posits that there were two ramps. An external ramp for about half of the height of the pyramid, which then became an internal ramp for the second half. Houdet's theory states that this internal ramp followed the sides of the pyramid in an ascending spiral pattern. A notch discovered in the edge of the Great Pyramid, known as Bob's Room, seems to support this theory. Located at the corners of each edge of the pyramid, these large rooms would have allowed workers to turn the stone by 90 degrees, allowing them to continue the ascent. The team chose to create rooms such as this one bringing Houdet's hypothesis to life. This long corridor was the first section of the ascending internal ramp. Through it, the blocks used to build the Great Pyramid would have been carefully moved upward and then turned at each edge of the pyramid in order to continue their ascent. Though the team only created the main ramp for the game, Houdet posits that this ramp had two levels, allowing workers to return safely to the bottom thanks to an additional corbelled upper section. According to Houdet, the start of the inner ramp was located at the base of the southeastern face of the pyramid. This location would have been the junction point of the external and internal ramps. Below us, workers would have built the lower part of the pyramid with the external ramp before eventually switching to the internal ramp for the middle and upper sections of the pyramid. At that time in the process, they could have reused the material of the external ramp to fill the center of the pyramid, hauling the stones in through the internal ramp. Welcome to the Great Pyramid Subterranean Chamber. From the original entrance of the Great Pyramid, there is a passage leading to the subterranean chamber. Its walls were carved out of the existing rock of the plateau and then covered in a fine unmarked limestone. The descending passage has a steep 26 degree downward slope. Narrow and with a low ceiling, this pathway is long and challenging. While the original passage was 145 meters long, the team reduced its length and made it both wider and higher. The main focus of the work in reproducing the location was centered upon preserving the unique claustrophobic environment of the Great Pyramid, while still allowing for a smooth game navigation. The well shaft was a 58 meter vertical passage that connected the descending corridor to the grand gallery above. An adjacent grotto may have originally been a small natural well in the bedrock that was enlarged during the tunneling. Whether the grotto was intended for another purpose is uncertain. There is much speculation over the purpose of the well shaft. One theory is that the channel was cut or enlarged to supply air to workers in the descending passage. Another is that it was meant to provide an exit route once the work was done in the heart of the pyramid, 
Without the well shaft, workers would have been trapped inside forever when the Grant Gallery was sealed. The opening at the bottom of the well shaft was most likely sealed by exiting workers to camouflage the passageway. There is a subterranean chamber at the end of the descending corridor, 30 meters below the Giza Plateau surface. Dug directly into the bedrock, the space is wide with a ceiling three meters in height. Its floors and walls are rough and uneven, indicating that it was never completed. At the south end of the room, there is another narrow corridor, similar to the others, though it abruptly ends after roughly 20 meters. The chamber also contains an 11 meter pit near the east side. It's unclear what this may have been used for. In the game, this well leads to a fictive underground complex containing key game-related mysteries. The subterranean chamber's original purpose remains a mystery. One popular theory is that it was originally meant to be Khufu's burial chamber, but the pharaoh changed his mind, preferring to be buried higher up in the pyramid, which would explain the chamber's unfinished state. Welcome to Khafre's funerary complex. Since the very beginning of the fourth dynasty, mortuary temples were built adjacent to pyramids on the eastern side. Such a location, facing the rising sun, as well as the world of the living as a whole, held an important symbolic meaning, for it was within the mortuary temple that kings were revived through daily rituals. In its standard form, a mortuary temple was divided into two parts, a front area which consisted of a vestibule and a courtyard, and an area in the back where all sacred elements were located. The back of the temple incorporated several essential features, including an inner sanctuary with a false door, which allowed the soul of the pharaoh to travel between the... The largest of all such structures, Khafre's mortuary temple was entirely built with megalithic blocks of limestone from a nearby quarry and encased with granite. Parts of Khafre's mortuary temple, particularly the courtyard walls, are thought to have been decorated with splendid reliefs. However, not a single image of the king has been discovered inside the mortuary temple. Khufu's direct successor, Jedifre, followed the custom which required each king to establish a new site for their funerary accommodation and chose Abu Rawash as his last resting place. When the time came to build his own funerary complex, Khafre, also one of Khufu's sons and the successor to Jedifre, broke with tradition and returned to Giza. Not only did Khafre thumb his nose at tradition, but he did so in a way which he hoped would allow him to overshadow his father's most important monument. Though Khafre's pyramid is smaller than Khufu's, it was cunningly built on a more elevated bedrock layer than the Great Pyramid, making it appear higher than any other pyramid at Giza. Today, Khafre's pyramid is the only one among the three at Giza that still has the upper part of its limestone casing. Considered a most sacred area, the Giza necropolis was strictly defined, both geographically and physically. An eight meter thick Tura limestone wall completely surrounded the Great Pyramid. The only way inside would have been through the mortuary temple. From the reign of Sneferu and onwards, the subsidiary pyramid became a common feature within the pyramidal complex. The function of the subsidiary pyramid, however, smaller in size and in height than the royal tomb, remains unclear, though some believe that it was meant to house the Ka of the pharaoh. 
In mainstream media, the ka is often defined as the soul of the deceased. The truth is a bit more complicated. Within the ancient Egyptian funerary belief system, the ka was a component of a living person, which separated itself from the body at the time of death. It represented the deceased's vital essence. In order for the deceased to ascend to a new life, whether in this world or the next, the ka had to be embodied in a statue and its existence maintained through offerings and rituals. Within Khafre's subsidiary pyramid, a wooden box containing pieces of cedar was discovered by archaeologists. When reassembled, it turned out to be a shrine mounted on a sled. Just as with the solar barges found around Khufu's pyramid, it seems Khafre's shrine and sled were ritually disposed of after his funeral. Welcome to Menkara's Funerary Complex. The dimensions of Menkara's pyramid are much less grandiose. However, unlike its predecessors, Menkara's pyramid shows a great deal of complexity in its internal and external finish. The outside was partially covered in red granite, while the internal walls were richly decorated. This latter innovation would not catch on until the end of the 5th dynasty, when pyramid texts began to adorn the walls. Menkara's pyramid contains two sloping passages, both located in the northern side of the structure. The upper one was abandoned during the construction phase, whereas the lower one, slightly above the base of the monument, constitutes the real entrance. The lower passage leads to a first room, which, for the first time since the reign of Djoser, is decorated with engraved false doors. While Menkara's pyramid complex was unfinished at the time of his death, it was hastily and somewhat shabbily completed by his successor, Shepsikov. Even so, this funerary structure marks a watershed in the history of this kind of monument. From then onwards, the pyramid shrank, whereas the mortuary temple expanded both in its quantitative and qualitative aspects. Of particular note, it is within Menkara's mortuary temple that one can find the heaviest block of limestone ever used for a pyramid complex, weighing in at over 200 tons. Menkara's causeway was completed in mud brick by the king's successor, whereas the lower part was nothing more than a simple ramp. As for the valley temple, it was built in two phases. The foundations were first laid out in limestone during Menkara's reign, but the temple itself was completed in mud brick afterwards. As such, the valley temple was soon damaged and ended up being completely rebuilt during the 6th dynasty. Three small structures, referred to as Menkara's Queen's Pyramids, were erected along the southern side of the main pyramid. One of them was a smooth-faced pyramid, while the other two were more basic step pyramids. It is difficult to assess whether the latter were designed as such or were left unfinished with no casing to smooth out their surfaces. The easternmost pyramid was built with the traditional rooms and corridors found within a satellite pyramid meant to house the king's ka. However, a granite sarcophagus was found within, leading to the conclusion that it was used as an actual tomb rather than as a symbolic cenotaph. Drawing on these observations, some assume that this pyramid was first built as a satellite pyramid for the king's ka before seeing its purpose change to that of a queen's tomb. Which queen, however, remains a mystery.